they were digging around in the Old Testament, their Bibles, trying to find out what they can see about this Jesus. And what they discover, one of the things, is that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Now, we sort of know that as part of the Christmas story, but for them, they'd sort of forgotten it if they ever knew it. Bethlehem wasn't a sort of big, important town like London or Southampton. It's a bit more like a small village, sort of Cublington or Biggleswade. If you're from those places, apologies, but Bethlehem was small. It was insignificant in size. But it was very significant in importance because God announces in that little verse that his special baby is going to come and going to be born in Bethlehem. And what these people discover as we read the story is that God's king has come. If you look at that verse number six, if you've got it in front of you and you're a reader, perhaps you can look down for the word that says that. I'm thinking of the word ruler. But you, Bethlehem, In the land of Judah, it's a bit strange, this is God speaking to the town. He says, out of you will come a ruler. The baby who's just been born is none less than the one who rules. That's a strange idea, perhaps, a baby Jesus. But he's saying that Jesus is the one who's in charge of everything. Jesus is the one who's in charge of everyone. And because he's God's king, God sent him, That is a very good thing, that Jesus is in charge. He's the ruler God's provided for the whole world. Now, is there anyone who uh, has a very large head who wouldn't mind coming to wear a large crown just for a few minutes? No one's going to admit that now, are they? um, um, Andy Nash is kindly volunteering. For want of anyone else... Grace, you've got a lovely, pretty head. I think it's a bit small, if you don't mind. But but come up in a moment. Andy, come up and wear an enormous crown, if you wouldn't mind. Here's the crown. May even be too big. Would you like to stand on that? Can you stand on there if your shoe's clean? Brilliant. (laughs) You might have to hold it for a few minutes. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Now, some people hear of Jesus being a ruler... It may not be a very sort of nice thing to hear because as you read your newspaper, there are all sorts of rulers in the world and lots of them don't do a very good job. In fact, quite a few do a terrible job because they don't look after their people at all well. And you think, is it really good that Jesus is going to rule us? If you've got it in front of you, look look back at verse 6 to see what kind of ruler this Jesus is going to be because he's described in the very last bit of verse 6 as the one who will be the shepherd of God's people. He's not just any old king. He's God's shepherd king. Uh, Shepherd, a nice image, isn't it? You think of a 2013 calendar, probably about February, and you get a hazy picture of some hills and maybe some sheep, and it's a comfy, cozy picture. But the shepherd looking after the sheep involved protecting them and protecting them from danger, like maybe wolves attacking them. So imagine it's bedtime, and all the, uh, all the sheep are in the pen, and across the doorway of the pen, the shepherd would lie down, so that in the night, if there was danger approaching, like a wolf, they had to deal with the shepherd before they could get to the pen. And if it came to it, the shepherd would lay his life down in order to save the sheep. Now, does anyone know what a shepherd might use as he uh, looks after his sheep? Yes. A crook. Yes, exactly that. A crook. Would you like to come and hold a crook? Brilliant. Come and hold a crook. Here's a brilliant large crook. Can you fit on the chairs as well? Stand next to Andy. Just tell everyone your name. What's your name? Mark. Mark. Hi, Mark. Thank you for helping. This is Andy. Andy, this is Mark. Hello, Mark. Brilliant. Can you manage that? Just hold on to him if you think you're going to fall off. Brilliant. There we are. There's a shepherd. He's a shepherd king. He's got a crown and he's got a crook because he's a, he's a shepherd who's going to look, uh, look after his sheep. So Jesus is a, a ruler, but he's a very selfless ruler. That is, he thinks more of the people he's looking after than, those, than, than himself. And he's come to shepherd his people by laying his life down for the sheep. And Jesus, as a shepherd ruler, he can't do anything more significant or more important for his people. That is very good news for our world, full of rulers who don't do a very good job. As we think of the world we live in, there are plenty of major problems. 
There are plenty, aren't there, of horrible situations. And we can feel hopeless. And we look at the situations, we think, where is God in all this? Well, the hope of the world, it doesn't lie in someone still to come. Our hope and our help has come in God's shepherd king. He brings the help that we most need for now, and that is forgiveness and friendship with God. And he promises the help that we most want, which is freedom from evil and sin and pain and suffering. So it's very good news for the world. It's very good news for each of us as individuals as well. We need someone who is strong enough to help us in our sin and our struggles. And if Jesus is God's shepherd king, if he has come, he's got all of that strength. And we need someone who's concerned enough who's going to be willing to help us as well. The king who really will shepherd his people. And the Lord Jesus is full of that love and compassion. And he comes to forgive and to comfort and to strengthen and to change us because he's the perfect shepherd king. Now, it might be if you're new to Christmas things and the Christmas story, you want to read a bit more about what Jesus has done as the shepherd king. And as you leave this morning, there are some booklets by the door called Christmas in Three Words. And you'll have to pick up a copy to see what those three words are in the booklet. But it outlines a little bit more of how Jesus has been the best shepherd king king we could possibly need and want. So as you go, um, do pick up one of those. That feels like it's the end of the talk, but it isn't. We're going to sing again, and then we'll come, come back for some more. And when we're chapter 2, we're going to dig a little bit more in just a moment. I wonder if anyone can guess what I might have in here. Before you guess, um, I'll give you some clues. It's quite small. Sometimes it's quite noisy. And after it's been noisy, it's quite messy. Does anyone want to guess? Mark? A baby? 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 Should we count to three and have a look? One, two, three. (laughs) Now, depending on whether you like party poppers or not, that will either have been a nice surprise or a nasty surprise. Now, if it was a nice surprise, you'd have thought, yay, party poppers. If you thought it was a nasty surprise, you probably would have thought, yeah, that's really irritating. (laughs) Now, those two reactions, nice surprise, nasty surprise, they're a little bit like the reactions in Matthew chapter 2 to the arrival of God's shepherd king. Perhaps you've got it in front of you, because as people see that Jesus is God's shepherd king, Just get this on the screen again. Some people come to worship Jesus. Some people think, yes, he is God's shepherd king, and we're going to worship him. So if you just look down in our passage and verse 2, these magi come from the east, and they ask, where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east. We've come to worship him. And then towards the end as well, in verse 11... They come to the house, and they see the child and his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. They realize this tiny little ball of flesh, this baby in the manger, is the one God has sent, and they treat him as God's king. And you can tell that because then they produce their presents, which are really, really expensive presents. There was gold, and there was incense, and myrrh. Gold was as worth as much as today. It's really, really valuable. Myrrh was about six or seven times worth more than gold. So they thought he was the best. They brought the best presents. And to worship Jesus, worshiping the shepherd king, means you treat Jesus as the most significant person who's ever lived. 
It means that Jesus has the greatest effect over every part of your life. That's what it is to worship him. And it doesn't mean that we do that in a kind of annoyed way. Oh, Jesus is king and I'm not. Because those who come to worship Jesus, they actually delight that he's come. They're very pleased. They worship with joy. Here's a, here's a smiley face. Here's people delighted that Jesus has come. I hope this might stay in here. There we go. Brilliant. In verse 10, if you have a look down at verse 10, if you've got your Bible still there, you see how they see the star over the stable, and it says they were overjoyed. They're delighted that Jesus, the shepherd ruler, has arrived. Now, what's surprising, you may not think that's a very great surprise, people come to worship Jesus, and isn't that what should have happened? But the surprising thing is who these people are. These uh, magi, they're probably not quite wise men who are you know, university professors stroking white beards, not quite that. They're probably just people who are very interested in looking at the stars, astrologers. They may have been those sort of people. And the thing about them is they're not local people. All the Christmas action is taking place around Jerusalem. But the magi, they are not the Jewish leaders who are twiddling their thumbs waiting for the king to come. They were people from miles away. They'd come from the east. You never would have expected them to be around the city at the time. And yet, funnily enough, they're the ones who worship Jesus as God's shepherd king. They're the ones who see it and get it. Some people come to worship Jesus, and it could be that they're the people that you would least expect to come to him. And it may be that in a, in a big church building like this with lots of people, there are people here who don't feel terribly at home in a church building. And you count yourself the least likely person to be thinking on Christmas Day about Jesus Christ and Christianity. The beauty of this shepherd king is he doesn't come just for the churchgoers and the smartly dressed moral people. No, he's a shepherd king for all sorts of people. It's a good reminder too, isn't it, to those who perhaps are here every week and we're part of the furniture and we're always around at church, we've been here a long time, do we always allow for the unexpected people to come and see this Jesus? Are we ready that they become part of things? Not just the fringe, but at the very heart of things. So some people come to worship Jesus, they're delighted that he's come and they give their lives to him. But there are some other people in our reading, and their response to Jesus isn't so good. It's a little more serious. Some people pretend to worship Jesus. Now just have a look down at verse 8, if you've got a read, or perhaps if you're holding a Bible for someone else. And I'm going to read verse 8, and then we'll think a little bit about it. He, that's Herod, sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. Has anyone been to a pantomime this year? Anyone ever been to a pantomime? Yeah, you may have been to a pantomime. What do you shout when um, the baddie comes on stage in a pantomime? Exactly, you shout boo and you hiss. Now, if, uh, if this story was a pantomime, which it isn't, um, people might have booed when Herod walks onto the stage. He is the baddie. And he says that he thinks he wants to go and worship Jesus too. He says, look, when you go and find him, come and tell me so that I can worship Jesus as well. But actually, he's pretending. He doesn't want to worship Jesus at all. And if we were in a pantomime and he said, I want to worship Jesus as well, what would everyone have said? Oh, no, you don't. Yes, exactly. But this isn't a pantomime, so we're not going to do that. Now, you're going to find out the reasons why Herod is pretending. If you're a reader, perhaps you could have a look at verse 13, which isn't in the bit we read, and verse 3. If you're not a reader, have a look at the picture on the screen in just a moment and work out how you think Herod feels about Jesus. If you're a reader, you can't look at the screen. <laughs> so if you're a reader, have a look at verses 13 and verse 3. If you're not a reader, what do you think Herod feels about Jesus, judging from the picture on the screen? Yeah. 
Okay, well, readers, you had a look at verse 13, which is just the next little bit. And that says that God just forewarns people that Herod doesn't want to worship Jesus. He actually wants to kill him. Unbelievable. And earlier in the bit that we did have read verse 3, it says that when Herod heard this, the news about the Jesus, he was disturbed. He was made very uncomfortable. So Herod thought that he was in charge. And he didn't like the idea of God's king coming to rule him. Some people, you see, pretend to worship Jesus because they're disturbed that he has come. They might look a little bit like this. They may be the people who are right at the center of the festive season and Christmas action. They might be at the center of church things even. And they can look and sound like they're God's people. And yet they're actually just pretending. They don't like anyone else coming to rule them. And coming under the rule of Jesus, it disturbs them. It makes them uncomfortable. I can't have Jesus shaping my career ambitions or my use of time and money or my personal longings. And they're just pretending. So just as we finish, here's a little question. How do I know if my worship of Jesus is real or not? This is quite serious. There's someone pretending... Well, one question you could ask yourself is, how do you respond to the news that God's shepherd king has come? Does that fill you with delight? Or does it disturb you? Does the idea of someone else being in charge of your life make you uncomfortable? Every area of life? Or is it a great relief that someone else is driving the thing all the way along? Is it much easier that the Lord Jesus should rule your life? And to know what it is to be delighted rather than disturbed by this king. Do you see who he is? Do you see that he's the ruler? Yes, but the ruler who comes to shepherd people. That is, everything he wants for people is the very best. He wants forgiveness and friendship. And he's perfectly powerful to do it for us. Well, well done for listening. I'm going to pray for us that over Christmas we would hear and see Jesus as he is. And we would be delighted to follow him. Out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Lord God, thank you so much that the perfect shepherd ruler has already come. We thank you that in Jesus we can know forgiveness of our sin, friendship with you, and perfect promises of a future without pain and suffering and sadness and grief. And we ask, Father, that as we hear and see Jesus truly for who he is, we may be those who delight to worship him and follow him with everything that we have and are. And we ask it for Jesus' name's sake. Amen.